Don't forget, you can reach the latest episode of Potomac Watch anytime. Just ask your smart speaker. Play the Opinion Potomac Watch podcast. From the Opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Welcome back. Let's turn to a big primary election on Tuesday in Missouri, where Congresswoman Cori Bush, a member of the squad and a certainly outspoken one, lost her election to Wesley Bell, a county prosecutor there. She is blaming, in large part, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, or APAC. Let's listen to part of what she said. APAC, I'm coming to tear your kingdom down. What you didn't want to do was allow me to get radicalized even more because this is the thing. I ain't scared. I don't fear you. APAC reportedly spent about $8 million in this race. But, Kate, to my mind, money in politics is often overrated in these kind of discussions by pundits, by members of Congress themselves, because there's a long list of candidates who have lit millions of dollars of their own on fire trying to get elected to Congress or get elected governor. And if they can't move the voters, it's because the voters don't like them. They're not popular. They have taken unpopular stances. And I find it hard to credit any Anybody for Cori Bush's defeat than Cori Bush, who in recent days was hemming and hawing about whether she considered Hamas to be a terrorist organization. Yes, Kyle, absolutely. I think the money line is overrated. I mean, that clip we just heard, did that strike you as very good retail politics? It did not strike me that way. I think she also had some federal investigation about her security details, some other things clouding her campaign. And she'd also taken a position on the war in Israel that was extremely unpopular. Even in the Democratic Party, it's not a commanding position. So I don't think it's a surprise necessarily that she lost, and I think she wasn't a strong candidate, and that's the end of it. Kim, another part of the argument that I think is fascinating is that Cori Bush voted against President Biden's trillion-dollar infrastructure law, saying that it should have included more things like free community college. And part of what I find fascinating about these races is the people who are defeating these squad members, and this is the second one. We also had Jamal Bowman in New York. York, Westchester County, lose his race to the county executive there. They're not losing to people who are substantively, it looks like to me, conservative or Republican. They're losing to people who are saying to voters, I believe in the same things that you do and uh, many of the same things that this other person does, except I'm going to go to Congress and do something other than stand outside and yell and try to raise money. I'm going to vote for the compromise if that's what it takes. I'm going to vote for my own president's infrastructure bill and not going to vote against everything as a way of raising my own profile. It's an excellent point. If you looked at this race, there was a lot of a focus on APAC. Cori Bush would like to make it sound as though this was entirely about her being targeted by APAC. This was a lot of talk, in fact, in the race, more on some of those issues that you mentioned. And she was hit particularly hard by her opponent on this question of her vote against the infrastructure bill. Now, I didn't love that bill, but it was a bipartisan bill. It contained a lot of agenda items that Joe Biden cared about. And her stated reason for voting against it was it didn't include everything that she wanted. She wanted the entirety of the Build Back Better agenda and all of these new entitlement programs that progressives have been demanding. And when that was not part of the package, or rather when Congress decided to go down the road of trying to get this bipartisan bill done, rather than that sweeping progressive agenda, she stomped her feet and decided that she was going to vote against it. And she was beat up for that, saying, hey, look, these are the kind of things that can benefit our district. And you're standing on the sidelines shouting and getting headlines and fundraising and making a lot of money for your campaign. But what are you doing for this district and the people who live in it? I think that was far harder for her in that race and far more a factor or as significant a factor in her loss as her position on Israel and the highlighting of that. One other quick thing I would just note is I'm really actually happy
happy to see this as well. A lot of people on the left are trying to beat up on APAC. What I saw in this APAC race was APAC playing in a primary with two Democrats. This was not the organization choosing Republicans or Democrats. It was saying we need a candidate and show that it's okay to be a supporter of one of our biggest allies, Israel. And I think that sends a message to other Democrats at a crucial time in the Democratic Party where some of them are terrified they're just going to get hit for their longstanding support for Israel. This was a group saying, hey, if you want to maintain those really strong and important ties, we've got your back. Kate, what about that message that this sends to other Democrats? I took a look at the issues page of Wesley Bell, the new Democratic candidate in this district, and he's for, you know, codifying Roe v. Wade, common sense gun reform and so forth. He does have a piece on foreign policy. He says Israel is the only democracy and strongest American ally in the Middle East. I believe Israel has a right to defend itself and go after those who perpetrated those attacks. But again, he does not strike me as somebody who is particularly toward the center of the democratic spectrum. But does this kind of a primary outcome send a message to other Democrats and maybe other Republicans that there is a cost potentially to trying to do politics just as a matter of provocation? And there's something to be gained potentially of getting into the legislative mix and voting for the infrastructure bill and potentially something to lose in the Democratic Party split as it may be on the question of Israel. Something to lose if you go too far in one direction there. I think that's absolutely a takeaway. I mean, I think that some of these members in solidly blue districts really underrated the political risks they were taking in, you know, describing what's going on in Gaza as a genocide and calling Joe Biden genocide Joe. I don't think that represents the position of even the median of the Democratic Party at this point, even though there is a loud, obviously, quite clearly, a loud plurality of Democratic voters who don't support Israel and who are equivocating on Hamas and its terrorism. But I don't think that is where the median voter is, even in a Democratic primary. And I think that that's part of what we've learned from one of these primaries. Now, you know, it's just, it is just one primary. And I continue to think that the other issues like the infrastructure bill and like cultivating a public profile at the expense of voting for things that her constituents want. I continue to think that's perhaps even more of a liability than her loud anti-Israel stance. But I do think, to Kim's point, is an important message to the Democratic Party, which members are starting to get terrified of their left flank on Israel. And for a Democrat to get picked off in a primary who supported that view does say, well, no, there are forces in America in politics and the Democratic Party that still want a Democratic Party that supports Israel, that still want America to have that relationship with, as Wesley Bell said, the only democracy in the Middle East. So I think that is a healthy hygiene for the Democratic Party that's going on. And, you know, the Republicans have struggled on the other side to get rid of some of their louder, more public profile members. So I think this is, if anything, just a healthy development for competitive parties. Thank you, Kate and Kim. Thank you all for listening. You can email us at pwpodcast at wsj.com. If you like the show, please hit that subscribe button. And we'll be back next week with another edition of Potomac Watch.